So think back, what were you doing when you were 16 years of age? Well, the singer that we're featuring in today's episode was winning a local talent contest, and despite having no professional experience before this, he was chosen to be the lead vocalist for a record that not only hit number one on the Billboard Hot 100, but it also became the second biggest single in the fiercely competitive year of 1967, one of the greatest years in rock history. Find out how a regular Joe like you and me became one of the most storied singers of the rock era. And it all started with him singing one of the shortest songs ever to top the chart. And again, one of the biggest hits of the 60s. Great story coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember the first time that you saw Adam West and Burt Ward as Batman and Robin in the groovy Batman TV show from the 60s, you're going to dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now, and also check us out on Patreon for even more content. There's an additional catalog of exclusive content there. You can also become an honorary producer to help us curate this music history. So even if you lived in Tennessee, you probably won't recognize the name. But back in 1966, there was a band from Memphis called the DeVilles. You know, after the iconic uh, Cadillac Coupe DeVille, a car that symbolized instant social status. All five members uh, were still in their teens at the time when they came together, uh, worried about balancing homework and band rehearsals more than they did about having a hit record. The DeVilles had only been a unit for a short time when they learned that there was already a band in New York that had the same name. So for a while, they didn't have a name for their group. After that setback, though, they were handed a four-leaf clover by a songwriter named Wayne Carson Thompson. On the suggestion of his friend, Chips Moman, uh, who owned ARS Studios in Memphis, Wayne gave the unbranded quintet one of his compositions called The Letter. Everything seemed to be all set up for the guys to go into ARS Studios and record The Letter, no problem. But when they performed the song for producer Dan Penn, he just didn't like the sound of their lead vocalist. And he ended up giving them an ultimatum. Come back with a new singer, and I will cut the record with you. Otherwise, no record. Wayne Carson Thompson, who passed away uh, actually in 2015, he was a versatile American country musician, songwriter, record producer. He was skilled in percussion, piano, guitar, and bass. Uh, his most famous compositions include The Letter, Neon Rainbow, Soul Deep, and of course, Always On My Mind, co-written with Mark James and Johnny Christopher. Always On My Mind earned multiple accolades, of course, including Grammy Awards for Song of the Year and Best Country Song back in 1983. In 1982, it reached number one on the Billboard Country Charts, and it was named Song of the Year by both the Country Music Association, 1982 and 1983, and the Nashville Songwriters Association International. Also a great cover by the Pet Shop Boys uh, beside uh, Willie Nelson. Uh, his version. The Academy of Country Music also honored it as single of the year in 82. You were always on my mind. Now the letter is the story of a man who receives a letter from his former lover, you know, saying she wants him back. Upon receiving the news, he drops everything and he flies out to see her immediately. Uh, Wayne wrote the song after his father suggested the line, give me a ticket for an airplane and he developed the song um, from there, from that line. Give me a ticket for an aeroplane. The song's premise revolves uh, around the vast, seemingly insurmountable distance between the speaker and his beloved. He's determined to get home, no matter the cost, don't care how much money I gotta spend, gotta get home to my baby again. Uh, and it's clear this journey is gonna take a long time to complete. <laughs> Writes a letter. Back in the day, right? With the letter in hand, perhaps tucked into the back pocket of his jeans, uh, he's scraping together money for that plane ticket to go see his lover. So after the unpleasant task of dismissing their lead vocalist, the four standing members of the former DeVilles, uh, Danny Smith, John Evans, Bill Cunningham, and Gary Talley, uh, they started their search for a new singer. Uh, and eventually they heard some buzz 
about a 16-year-old named Alex Chilton. Now, Alex had just won a talent contest at Central High School in Memphis. Uh, Alex Chilton came from a somewhat rarefied background. Uh, his mother owned a respected art gallery. His father was a jazz pianist. Outside his impressive showing at the local talent contest, he hadn't done much else to turn any heads, but that was going to change in a flash. Saying, help the deaf, the dumb, and the blind. Entering the studio to perform on his first recording, Alex was understandably nervous. His first take was delivered in a soft-spoken manner, similar to his natural speaking style. Now, Dan Penn, the producer, he pulled the young singer aside and he gave him two pieces of advice and proved to be genius. So the first thing that Dan Penn told Alex Shilton to do was to give the song a huskier vocal, you know, to put some grit into it, put some relish on it. And then he told him to slightly change the lyric from give me a ticket for an airplane to give me a ticket to an aeroplane. You know, Dan felt that adding that extra syllable it would put Alex's vocal perfectly in stride with the melody of the song. Anyway, yeah. Now, Wayne Thompson didn't take too kindly to the alteration of his lyric to Aeroplane. Aeroplane. Uh, it was one of many disagreements that he had with Dan Penn's ideas. In addition to the change in the first line, Wayne, who also played rhythm guitar on the track, he actually didn't like the way that Alex Shilton sang his song, even though Dan Penn loved it. Ain't got time to take a fast train. So let's pause for a second so we can talk about our sponsor. I get excited to talk about Magic Spoon because I'm such a big cereal lover. I get the variety pack with six different flavors sent directly to my home. You know, one of my favorite Magic Spoon flavors is cocoa. So when I discovered the cocoa cereal from Magic Spoon, I had to try it. I have to say it's really good and it has no sugar and 14 grams of protein instead of 10 grams of sugar and only 1.5 grams of protein. I mean, at this stage of my life, if I can enjoy my love for cereal and get the nutrition that I need for a busy lifestyle without sacrificing taste, that's a no brainer. I also love it for my kids too. As long as it tastes good, they could care less. So I won't make a big deal out of them eating something healthy for breakfast. Check out Magic Spoon for you and your family and have some fun with it. Click on the link right up here and use my code Professor of Rock, all caps, to get $5 off your delicious high protein Magic Spoon cereal. The link's below in the description as well. The biggest fight between uh, the writer and the producer was about the jet airplane sound effect. He yelled at Dan in frustration, the jet sound doesn't make sense. Wayne went on to say that he clearly thought that Penn had lost his mind. Despite the opposition from Wayne and from studio manager Chip Moman, uh, the airplane sound effect stayed on the record, strategically placed in the song's coda. Now, what set the recording session for the letter apart was not just how well written Wayne Carson's song was, but also that it marked the first session that was fully overseen by Dan Penn. At just 26 years of age, Penn was a songwriter with an extraordinary knack for capturing the timeless truths of soul music. You know, both Dan Pan and Alex Chilton were unique talents. And it's likely that on some level, they recognized this quality in each other, creating a partnership that truly soared. When the group recorded the letter, they hadn't yet settled on a name. Now, their manager, Roy Mack, suggested the mailboxes to tie in with the song's title, you know, kind of gimmicky. However, another member proposed, let's have a contest where everyone can send in 50 cents and a box stop. A box top was typically cut out and mailed in for breakfast cereal promotions, of course. This inspired producer Dan Penn to dub this band The Box Tops. That's where it came from. Very cool. The letter was released in August of 1967, and within just six weeks, it reached the top spot on the Billboard Hot 100, where it stayed for four weeks. The song was a massive hit. It sold over four million copies. And it became the second biggest single of 1967, one of the most competitive years in rock history. Now, ultimately, the letter became one of the standout hits of the 60s, really. Like many great records from that era, every element from the arrangement to the vocals to the instrumentation, it was just perfect, perfectly in place. The letter had a big effect on U.S. soldiers that were serving in Vietnam at the time. 
The soldiers depended on letters from home, especially from a wife or a girlfriend to give them, you know, an emotional lift to get through the misery of being thousands of miles away and the uncertainty of war uh, with their lives constantly under enemy fire. The Letter by the Box Tops. It was nominated for two awards at the 10th Annual Grammy Awards in 1968. Best Contemporary Group Performance and Best Performance by a Vocal Group. Now, at one minute and 58 seconds, The Letter by the Box Tops was the last number one hit to be under two minutes long. That is until 2019 when Lil Nas X's Old Town Road topped the Billboard Pop Survey, and that one was one minute 53 seconds. No comment on that one. So from October 20th to October 27th, 1967, the letter and the hombres, let it out, let it all hang out, held the top two spots on the WLAS AM Silver Dollar Survey, a rare occurrence where both of the top two songs featured members from the same family, the Cunningham brothers, each in a different top 40 band. Bill Cunningham, the bassist, keyboardist, and backup vocalist for the box tops, and B.B. Cunningham Jr., who was the lead singer for the Hombres, both hailing from the birthplace of blues and rock and roll, good old Memphis, Tennessee. Shade, nobody knows what it's all about. It's too much, man. Let it all hang out. Now, the box tops scored a massive international smash with the letter, but after that, their spotlight slowly dimmed. Most of the recordings that followed their debut album, The Letter Slash Neon Rainbow, including the number two gold single, Cry Like a Baby, and the critically acclaimed 1969 album, Dimensions, featured Alex Chilton backed by the American Studio House Band. Producer Chips Moman uh, preferred using his own musicians, an ace team that included guitarist Reggie Young and drummer Gene Chrisman. These guys backed hits uh, for Neil Diamond and Wilson Pickett. Elvis Presley, and many, many others. Box Tops member John Evans, he expressed his disillusionment to writer Rob Gordon about being stymied by Chips Moman and the management group that controlled the Box Tops. He said, put yourself in my place. A 19-year-old kid finally gets a chance to do something he wanted to do for years. It ends up being number one in the country for an entire year. Does it even seem reasonable, much less fair, that we can't play on our own records? End of quote. Now keep in mind that Alex Chilton was also just a teenager. His stunning debut performance on the letter uh, captured the attention of many other bands looking for a lead vocalist at that time. For example, Alex was one of the top three candidates to replace Al Cooper as the lead singer for Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Uh, him along with Stephen Stills and the man who eventually won the job, David Clayton Thomas. Uh, who is the catalyst behind their leap to multi-platinum status in 1969. Catch a pony, let the wheel turn. Following the success of the letter, Alex's parents allowed him to quit high school, where he was kind of struggling, you know, so that he could uh, be with the, the box tops full-time and pursue a career in the music business. Although his vocals were featured on the box tops records, Alex was cheated out of money and was at the mercy of unfair deals and crooks with no artistic control whatsoever. Just like the other four original members of the Box Tops, they had to deal with that as well. A year after the Box Tops officially dissolved in 1970, Alex formed Big Star. Big Star originated in Memphis, Tennessee, featuring a core lineup of Alex Chilton on vocals and guitar, Chris Bell on vocals, guitar, Jody Stevens on drums, and Andy Hummel on bass. They are praised as a quintessential American power pop band and are regarded as one of the most legendary and influential cult acts in rock and roll history. Uh, their music in the initial phase drew inspiration from 60s pop groups like the Beatles and the Birds, shaping a sound that anticipated uh, the alternative rock movements of the 80s and the 90s. Now, despite their breakup in 1974 after releasing only three LPs, Big Star left behind a seminal body of work uh, that profoundly influenced bands emerging in subsequent decades. I mean, there's R.E.M., Teenage Fan Club, The Posies, The Replacements, just to name a few. Throughout his career after the demise of the box tops, Alex Chilton enjoyed performing in unconventional venues and settings. Alex renounced career advice and opted not to have a manager, showing little interest in fame or recognition at all. 
During his solo performances, he often disregarded crowd favorites, instead choosing to play whatever he felt like in the moment. On any given night, his set could range from jazz to polka, or it could be entirely composed of cover songs showcasing his unpredictable nature. He prioritized his own enjoyment over public opinion. Alex's musical style was a paradox, blending rawness with refined arrangements that featured expansive choruses and lyrics that resonated deeply with his fans. Now, while his songs didn't achieve mainstream chart success, man, they definitely forged strong emotional connections with listeners. Artists like The Replacements frontman Paul Westerberg, one of the greatest songwriters of all time, he admired Alex's independence. Now for Westerberg, Alex was a hero, best exemplified by the song that he wrote titled Alex Chilton, one of the best songs of the 80s. Alex Chilton by The Replacements, it originally began as a demo titled George from Outer Space. The lyrics were referencing Replacements roadie George Lewis but Westerberg later revised the lyrics as a tribute to Chilton, who was experiencing a resurgence in popularity within the college rock scene in the late 80s. Man, Paul Westerberg crafted a melodic, sing-songy pop-style track that was reminiscent of Big Star, incorporating a chord sequence that reflected the influence that Chilton's music had uh, on this crazy artist. The track's chorus, I'm in love with that song, that stemmed from Westerberg's first encounter with Alex, where he awkwardly expressed admiration for a specific big star track, Watch the Sunrise, but in his nervousness, he forgot its title. So the line, checking his stash by the trash at St. Mark's Place, that was inspired by a lunch meeting with Alex involving Westerberg and the replacements manager, Peter Jesperson. Man, Alex Chilton, like I said, is one of my favorite songs of the 80s by one of my all-time favorite bands, The Mats. Let me know if you'd like to see an episode on Big Star or The Replacements in the future. Now, the original members of the Box Tops, including Alex Chilton, reunited in 1996 to record a new album and a subsequent tour. There were some isolated shows that featured at least two of the members, that was it. Then in 2010, during a busy week of live shows, Alex Chilton complained of having chest pains for a few weeks, but he didn't seek any medical attention. He died of a heart attack at just 59 years of age. Danny Smythe, who was the drummer and background vocalist for the Box Tops, he passed away in 2016. Guitarist John Evans left the music business in 2000 to further his endeavors in the computer industry. Multi-instrumentalists uh, Bill Cunningham and Gary Talley still team up as the box tops on the oldie circuit, such as the annual Happy Together Tour. On behalf of all five founding members, Bill, Gary, and John accepted the induction of the box tops into the Memphis Music Hall of Fame in 2018. In 1997, Wayne Carson Thompson was inducted into the Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame. Uh, he passed away on July 20th, 2015 at the age of 72. Wayne's lyricism has stood the test of time because of its emotional power. Uh, he wrote songs about the intensity of human relationships. The letter was certainly one of his finest hours, a song that began with a simple line from his father that progressed into a song about hope and the restoration of love and happiness. You know, you think about it, back in 1967, when Wayne wrote this eternal pop classic, there was no internet, there were no cell phones, no social media platform for instant communication with someone, no matter how far away. Even making a long distance phone call was an ordeal back then. Yet Wayne's composition, it evokes something deep and desperate in all of us, wondering about the past and what could have been, or looking into the future and dreaming of what life will bring us. The letter is a metaphor of an answered prayer. Now that my prayer has been answered, give me a ticket to an aeroplane so I can get leave from the misery and get to that happy place as fast as humanly possible. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Alex Chilton, about the box stops and the letter. What are your memories of this song? 
What do, you, what do you think? Should I do an episode of The Replacements for Big Star? Let's have a great discussion below about this song. I think it's such a classic. If you like our content, we invite you to be a part of our community full time. Click on the red button to subscribe. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Mm -hmm.